Hello and welcome to UX Insiders, a live event hosted by the UX Design Institute and featuring contributions from the most interesting and most creative people in the UX field. In the UX Design Institute, we aim to deliver world-class education to the next generation of UX professionals. With our live events, we aim to bridge the gap between education and industry for budding designers by talking to some of the best people working in UX. And with today's guest, we certainly aren't playing around. Om Tandon has been working in the games industry for over 15 years in several leadership and UX roles, building teams, processes and pipelines. He has created massively entertaining and monetizing experiences for brands like Star Trek, Disney, 20th Century Fox, Hasbro, Ice Age, My Little Pony, Wizard of Oz, Marvel and many, many more. I'm sure you've heard of some of them. Currently, Om heads the UX or department at the mobile games publisher Wildlife Studios. Um, we are so excited to have you here today, and the response to this event has been so, so positive. There will be time for a Q&A during the event, so I'll ask anyone tuning in to please type any questions you have for Om um, in the questions panel, and we'll run through them throughout the event relevant to whatever topic it is that we're covering. And if you see a question there that you particularly want to hear the answer to, you can upvote, upvote it, and we, it'll be prioritized at the top of the list. So here we go. Om, um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me today, Luis, and yeah, excited to be here. So let's go back to the very beginning, the beginning of Om Tandem as a games designer. Were you always passionate about games? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Luis. So in my childhood, like um, I moved around a lot because my dad was in the army. So a lot of time spent around, you know, military sites. You see cool stuff like tanks, you know, military hardware. Um, yeah. And so there's a bit of fantasy about, you know, what your dad is doing, the armed forces. So um, I think a lot of that rubbed on me. Then I was like an average kid, you know, um, enjoying comic books, trying to create things out of, you know, whatever you had. I had one bad habit. I would break any toy my, uh, you know, parents would bring me within two days. So after a time, they stopped buying toys for me. They were like, yeah, you're just not going to, you know, it's not going to last. It's not worth it. So I was like, what to do? I'm in a fix. And then I thought, okay, when I break apart something, I want to put it back together. So I ended up creating my own toys, not just from, you know, old toys. But anything I could find, like cardboards, newspapers, and some of that stuff was pretty creative, even for me. That's what people told me. I'm not going to take any credit there. So I think that got me into that making habit. Um, so yeah, that, that's how, you know, uh, I was introduced to the world of games later on. Like, uh, I always wanted to um, become somebody like who wanted to create new stuff, concept art, you know, uh, maybe designing cars. I'm sure a lot of people have that uh, aspiration. Uh, but as I grew older, I found that uh, games is somewhere, you know, I can express my creativity when it's talking about innovation, building something from scratch. So, yeah, that's how I landed in games industry. I like that analogy of breaking and then making tools <laughs> as, as your way to get into becoming a, a UF designer later on. Um, so could you walk us through maybe your early education and your early career and how you ended up being a, a games designer? Of course. Uh, so it was a bit of a struggle for me. I originally hailed from India. Um, so when we are talking about back in, you know, early 2000s, games industry was not very well established. And for me, my background is uh, like after completing, I, I had taken sciences like biology, maths, uh, up till class 10th and 12th. And then uh, for my bachelor's, I actually did economics honors, a course in economics honors, which I, where I studied macroeconomics, microeconomics. And once I graduated, I was ready to, you know, um, I sat for a MBA exam. I know people won't believe it, but I sat for an MBA exam and I got a decent score. I had, you know, I've scored up, up to 80 percentile, which is a pretty decent score. And I had invitations from 12 colleges. I very distinctly remember that evening. And my parents were like happy, you know, on the moon. Oh, you have invitations from the best colleges in the country. And I was like, something is not right. This is not what I want to do. Uh, having gone through, you know, three years of college degree where, where I did fairly well, but I was never convinced that, you know, like, like I mentioned, that creativity part was not there for me. So I thought, oh, what should I do? I should look for something in, in creative industry. So I still remember I Googled and I was like, okay, game design colleges in India, you know, nothing came up. What came up was graphic design because in India at that time you only had outsourcing companies. And to be frank, guys, Gaming was not that big then, you know, there was no mobile gaming, even PC games were there, but it was very niche PC and console. So I found a graphic design course uh, in India, which was a UK, UK university, which had a course in India. 
I said, fine, I'll enroll for that three years course because I had to learn everything from scratch. And my meta goal was I'll go through this course, but in the end, I, I will prepare my portfolio in a way that I end up in a gaming company. And that's precisely what I did. It in fact took me one more year after completing that course to still work on my portfolio. I got numerous rejections. Probably one company rejected me over five times because they were like, you had good graphic design skills, dude, but you don't have a bachelor's in you know, fine art, which is what they were looking for. Uh, well, anyways, 15 years later, <laughs> I'm here. So a lot of struggle, but it, the lesson is like, if you are really passionate about something, you know, you'll find your way. You go against the grain, you find a way. Yeah. And I believe you prepared a little presentation just about the journey of your career that helps you explain how you got from there and to where you are today. Uh, it's more like a bit of intro to UX design and, you know, a case study I want to share. Um, but yeah, we can definitely talk more about the journey if people are interested in that. You know, which, um, well, I want, there's one thing that there's one key element that I think was quite interesting in the in your career uh, timeline. Mm -hmm. So you made the switch from art director to UX UI designer. So what, at what point of your career did that happen? And what was it that made you realize that that was the direction you wanted to head in? Yeah, Louis, that's, that's a very interesting question. Sure, I'll, I'll dwell on it a, a little. So, um, like I said, I did a bachelor's in economics honors and then, you know, mass, a kind of a vocational course, three years course in advertising graphics. So my, my, none of my education was lost because what I didn't realize at that time was, yeah, I knew I wanted to do something creative. So in my graphic design degree, I learned a lot about visual design, advertising. And to be honest, even UI design did not exist uh, because it was all website based, right? So UX designers was not a term, you know, which was used very broadly. Only top companies were, had a UX designer. But uh, graphic design gave me the necessary skill set required to think about layouts because visual design has a lot of stuff, you know, uh, which consciously or unconscious, unconsciously UI designers use in their day to day work, like layouts, you know, uh, principle of cohesion, uh, legibility, uh, readability, usage of colors for drawing attention, all that good stuff. But when I studied economics honors, I also studied a lot, a lot of macroeconomics, consumer behavior. And there was an element of what we call behavioral economics, which lapped a lot with psychology, which was very, very near to my heart. So at some point in time, as I talk about it, both of these came together. I think having experience in consumer psychology or behavioral economics and visual design was you know, the right kind of education set, which later fused. So anyway, talking about my journey, my first job, I got a job as a concept artist. So I was an intern and my job was to create, you know, uh, using digital tools, uh, cool characters, uh, weapons, futuristic landscapes, or mythological landscapes, all the cool art that you see in video games today, or even in cinema. That was the kind of things that I did. And I joined as an intern. I, I learned a lot over there. But then I realized, okay, I was more interested in the 3D, 3D uh, part of the game development process. Because as a concept designer, there was a lot of 2D work. So I was doing a lot of pencil work, drawing, uh, digital coloring, Photoshop, you know, all that stuff, matte painting. Some of you might have heard those terms. But then um, my art director told me, hey, you're pretty good at, you know, drawing or painting. Uh, we want you to paint textures for 3D models. So 3D models are like 3D models, which can go inside a real game engine. And you first create the model and then you put a texture on top of it. So it gives it more, you know, life, lifelike. It looks more lifelike. So I transitioned from concept art to 3D, um, spent some time there, learned a lot of skills. And then so, uh, one day, one of the guys was not, they were, the, they were different projects in the company. So one of the uh, producers came in and he said, I I'm not liking the user interface of, you know, this particular game I'm working on. It needs to feel a bit more, you know, authentic. Like it used to have grunge element. Like it was a, it was a game about, you know, flying World, World War II planes. And he wanted to bring that retro element in the user interface. I haven't worked much with user interfaces before, but he was like, hey, you, you, you draw pretty cool textures. I'm sure you can do something about it. I'm like, okay. So no time given and say, just jump right into it. And that's where I think Louis, it goes back to my childhood, you know, because I had that uh, breaking and, you know, making mentality. So it's always... And even in my graphic design education, we, we learned a lot about deconstructing things and then, you know, putting them together in a new way. So anytime they threw a new challenge to me, I was like, and this is all self, you know, you're researching on your own. I'm like, okay, what is user interface? And then I said, yeah, there's quite a bit of overlap because I've made a lot of layouts uh, in advertising in graphic school and user interface seems somewhat like that, but there are some different visual design principles, which I have to follow. So that's why I got into UI and then 
there was a lot of interest about ux coming around you know 2000 uh, i think 5 or 7 you were hearing more about ux designers i didn't know what it is but uh, incidentally my wife is also a ux manager and she always always worked on the enterprise side you know so the mainstream software industry and i was in game so she first transitioned to ux and she's like yeah this is like a whole new world you know and uh, we are like okay she was also a graphic designer like me uh, uh, in her education years. So that was one point of, you know, access. Okay. She's enjoying it. It's something new. I also want to, you know, see what it is like. So then an opportunity came up for me in New Zealand. I started working for a company called Gameloft, which, which is actually sister of Ubisoft. You guys have, must have heard of the developer of Assassin's Creed, but Gameloft worked mainly on mobile. So I joined as their first UX designer in the New Zealand studio. And again, it was this challenge. Okay. What is UX? I had done some courses by then, but the bigger challenge was how to apply UX to games because there was no precedent. There were no examples. So, you know, again, I had to research a lot. Um, I read a lot of books and then I also saw how, how does that changes? How do you adapt it to what is different about UX in games compared to let's say UX in mainstream software. Uh, so yeah, that was my learning curve. And I think that was the point in game loft way back in, I think 2000, no, even even before that, actually, sorry, I transitioned in education games in 2007, and then the game lock opportunity came. So that was the point I felt, yeah, all all that I've learned, uh, different disciplines have gone together, and my education now is at the right point, you know, where we can I can apply that lens of research with you know visual design in the field of UX. Yeah. We've got a great question here from Daniel, um, which I think is something that a lot of people would wonder. Um, Daniel asks, how do you differentiate between a UX designer working on a game and a game designer? Yeah, that's a very good question. So there are two different discipline guys, okay? I'll be very clear about it. A game designer is not a game UX designer. However, you might find a person who has studied game design. So game design is a course on its own where they learn about you know um, how to design mechanics and what we call core loops and meta loops. Um, which uh, form a good basis of a solid uh, or solid foundation of a game, which players will enjoy. It has different things like reward cycle, uh, action cycle, you know, all that good stuff. So a game designer is very close to becoming a UX designer if they, you know, train, up train themselves or upskill themselves. And so what I do in my day to day work is every team has a game designer. If you're talking about outside games industry, this role is done by what we call business analysts or business intelligence. They write the specs, feature specs, what we call. But I think a UX designer needs to also need not be a game designer, but you need to understand what game design is because they are putting together a mechanics or a feature. You need to understand what is the motivation, why they're doing it and what this will achieve. So I think there's a very strong correlation, collaboration between the two disciplines, uh, games design and UX design. And do you think it's important for a UX games designer to be into games? When you say into games, yeah, that, that's a good question. I get get that asked quite a bit. And I know the normal answer you'll hear is, yeah, you need to be passionate about gaming. You need to be playing a lot of games. So I'll, I'll break the myth. No, I was never a gamer. <laughs> the first game I started enjoying was Plant vs. Zombies. Why? Because I really sucked at playing, you know, online games. Um, but Plant vs. Zombies was the PC version was the first game that I started playing and enjoying. So I play games, but I'm not a gamer. But I have a I'm more of an analyst. When I play them, I enjoy more deconstructing them. Oh, why, why does this work? Why, why is this reward movement in this game better than this game? You know, what is this game doing different from this? So you need to be someone who has interest in games, whether it's watching games on Twitch, analyzing them or playing them, that will that you really need to do. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to be somebody playing 40 games, 40 hours a week. That will become part of your job later. But uh, you should have an interest in games and um, understand like what makes them tick. That's good enough. You know. With most software and with UX design, UX design is there to help a user kind of reach a purpose without having to think too much. It's all about solving a problem. But mm -hmm. with games, part of the process is actually kind of sometimes solving a problem yourself or trying to think about what you're going to do next. So how do you incorporate that kind of UX thinking into a game when part of the game is all about being challenged. Yeah. So again, when I get into my presentation, I'll show you. So there, that's what I meant I, when I said, you know, there are certain nuances, uh, you know, differences. So the, the simplest way I can put it is um, most of the times, not always, UX, if we talk in a generic sense, or when I say generic, more mainstream software, 
it's about um, eliminating friction you know reducing cognitive load but in games it's not about eliminating friction it's about managing that friction because again friction as you said equals you know challenge there so i'll talk a bit more about it in uh, in my slide because i have that covered there um but yeah there, there are various ways we do we have that, that's the kind of sensitivity you have to develop you know where do you need player to have autonomy where do you want to you know do hand holding where do you where, how how should the difficulty curve be maintained you know it also depends a lot on the genre of the game you know what kind of game it is and what kind of person is playing it you know what's your persona and demographics because if somebody who is very new to games you definitely want to give them you know hand holding to make them learn the ropes because uh, they won't know much about uh, they'll get frustrated if they're not able to make progress but on the other hand there are a lot of experienced gamers out there you you tell them something everything dictated to them they're like yeah stop teaching me you know this is frustrating for me so yeah it's a very fine balance identifying the genre of the game experience of the player and of course your own knowledge of both game design and games you are designing do you want to go through your your slides your presentation now and then we can Absolutely. yeah <laughs> we can gather around and <laughs> listen to your expertise okay share screen uh, let me know when you guys are able to see my screen can you see the presentation please yeah looking good All right, so just um, a few slides just about me, building up on what Louis said, guys. Hi everyone, I'm a UX director. Um, I've been very fortunate to have worked in gaming industry for 15 years. Uh, these are some of the brands I've worked for, especially gaming products for some of these brands. Uh, and I consider myself very lucky to have been exposed to you know so many different franchises. Um, yeah, so my experience uh, spreads across um, PC, console, casino, and mobile, and also education gaming. So in a way. i have kind of uh, covered all the <laughs> different platforms so far uh, other than ar and vr which uh, which you know we have games on um, i have a bachelor's in economics honors and i think the biggest thing i learned there as i mentioned you guys there was a module about behavioral economics and that's pretty good because you know psychology under, uh, understanding of human behavior and human mind is very important for ux designers doesn't means that you have to be a psychologist but Uh, we we see that many psychologists and anthropologists also you know uh, do fairly well pretty well in ux because you should know about human behavior um then a master in advertising graphics and currently the number of products i've worked on they engage over 150 million players worldwide um yeah uh, i i've also been lucky to have traveled a bit while working so i've worked all the way from san francisco to the farthest reaches of auckland right now i'm based in dublin ireland so it's pretty good working in different geographies and one of the reasons i travel so much is because um when i feel that i am peaking i've learned everything i've learned here you know i i want to see okay uh what else what else is there to learn how can i better myself that that was the reason why i looked for jobs outside india uh and to be honest i moved moved out pretty late i was a creative director by the time i left india so you know most people would think about settling down i was like no no i think i don't think there's anything else i can learn here i need to go abroad and learn more uh all right so talking a bit about games industry um games industry is booming guys and there there are number of reasons for it you know the technology the platform um mobile especially the launch of apple and you know uh, android smart devices it really uh made sure that everyone in the world today has a very powerful gaming console right in the back of their pockets you know and it's so easy to use but just to put it on a scale games industry annual revenue is twice more than hollywood hbo and netflix combined yeah you heard it right so this is not a very well known fact but the, but the revenue generated by combined gaming industry across all platforms is twice uh, what you see in cinema or you know um hollywood and even hollywood and hbo combined So this is just a, a couple of stats uh, to you know give you an I give you guys an idea about you know the scope of this industry because I'm sure a lot of you are studying the discipline right now and you might be like yeah that's great om it's passionate it's creative but can you really make a career in this industry so if you ask me this question let's say 5 years back i would say think about it <laughs> you know because it's a very hard road i i i talked a bit about it in my journey right to get into it but today It, it has changed. It's it's become very commercially viable just because of the number of people who are playing games on a daily basis. You know, so this is a 2021 stats, and you can see that in 2021 it was estimated over three billion people, close to three billion people, play games regularly. They play games, you know, on different platforms, 
And that's almost one third of world's population. And this number is only growing. So, you know, definitely there's demand for gaming because it's a form of entertainment, right? That's one way to look at it. And in 2022, we know that games industry is projected to reach $203 billion in revenue across all platforms. And you can see that a chunk of that, plat uh, that revenue is coming from smartphone games. So you can see that it's 91.4 billion. So nearly half of that 203 billion is coming from smart devices. Um, that's how successful, or that's the kind of boost, you know, gaming got when smart devices were launched. So yeah, to be honest, this is the best time to join games industry. It's still tough to get in, but I can tell you uh, being a hiring manager, yeah, there's more demand than supply. It's very skewed. It's very difficult to find, you know, games UX designer. It's a very thriving uh, profession, to be honest, right now. All right. And one example I want to show you guys is, okay, yeah, Om, you are saying, you know, um, there is an increase in number of people who are playing games. Why is that happening? So one example I can give you is Roblox. I'm sure a lot of you might have heard of Roblox. What is Roblox? If you've not heard of it, I'm sure you have heard about Minecraft. So Roblox is like Minecraft, okay? Uh, but it allows kids or anybody who wants to, you know, engage with this platform. It's an online platform. You can actually build games on this. So they give you the building blocks, the tools, and you can put together a game and you can actually monetize it. You can make other people play it and pay, pay you for it. And it's not surprising. A lot of teens and tweens, 14 years old, 16 years old are, you know, actually uh, not only playing games on Roblox, they're building their own games on Roblox. And I think the combined revenue two years back was the developer paid a close to $60 million to, you know, all these developers on their platforms. So user generated content generated by their players. So it's a very big success story because Roblox went public at $43.5 billion in 2021. Okay. So that that's like a, one of the biggest IPOs for a gaming company and even for a tech company. Right. But here's what people miss. So this is just a chart of, you know, monthly hours of playtime. So you can see that Roblox started in 2007 as a website. And you can, you can see that, you know, that there wasn't much traction way back then, but then as you see 2020 and 21, you know, it's very obvious player engagement more than doubled in pandemic. So the number of people who started playing games just on Roblox doubled, And, um, that was actually true of the entire gaming industry in COVID times. We saw record growth, not only it was existing people playing games, but new people, because, you know, people were in lockdown, what to do. So more and more people they had access to games on mobile, uh, you know, or PC. We saw that a lot of new players got added because of pandemic. Now, if you look at this peak, it's very easy to kind of make this assumption. Yeah, you're right. Um, COVID caused this, but look at the long tail. That's not true. If you look at 2007, think about it. People. So Roblox core audience is defined as tweens, you know, players are nine to 14 years old. They are tweens, right? Now, all these nine to 14 years who are the base uh, or the majority of, um, let's say, player base of Roblox were one to three years old in 2007. You know, this generation just got born then. And what were the parents doing? They were giving them their mobile devices to keep them busy. These guys actually started playing games very early on. And think about it. Like, if, if I go back to my childhood, you know, I was reading comic books when I was probably four years, five years, six years old or playing with toys. Uh, or, you know, car models. And what did you aspire to do? You were like, yeah, comic books are so cool. These car models are so great. I want to become a car designer. I want to design a superhero character. I'm sure lo most of us growing up had that aspiration, right? I know that changes as, as you grow older. But think about it for these kids who were one to three years old back in 2007, playing games on platforms like Roblox, they always aspire to I want to build games. And by the time they were in this age group, they, they had the tools. Roblox gave them the tools to build their games. So it's not like that pandemic caused, pandemic was a trigger, but the actual journey for Roblox started here. This whole new generation, which we called, you know, Gen Alpha, uh, actually um, started picking up on, uh, you know, or started interacting with games or this technology way before they reach, this is where we are seeing the maturity. So that's the long tail of, you know, how we are seeing traction built up, uh, how we are gaining new players. And I saw a recent study. It's not only newer generation, which is very dexterous with mobile phones because they have exposure to games very early on, not only games, but even social media. So we can say that they're very tech savvy, but even amongst what we call baby boomers or, you know, millennials, these are people who are in age group 40 plus or 60 plus 70 plus. We are seeing that, um, 
the people who who are using in these age groups technology or playing games their engagement level is also going up we are seeing the number of people playing these games go up because of you know um so much traction uh, devices becoming more accessible games becoming more accessible and accessibility is a big thing not not just in ux but even in games so you know yeah that's why we are seeing this massive growth and now yeah i'll go back to this question which came in uh for me one of there, there are a lot of differences but for the sake of this uh, presentation i'm going to focus on one of the biggest ones so biggest difference i see is ux in games is not same as mainstream ux there are definitely nuances uh again don't misquote me a lot a lot of what we do is still rooted in the foundation of mainstream ux like we follow the same methods same tools same heuristics same methodology same way of user research but there are some you know differences so what are these differences so this is one quote when i started my games ux journey you know i was researching and i was reading a lot of articles so when i was reading one of the articles this quote you know struck a chord with me uh, a game is interesting and engaging because it creates loads on user and this is a quote from you know susan wenching most of you would know her she she is the author behind you know 100 things every designer should know a very famous behavioral psychologist and i was that time figuring out i was in a gaming company working on the ux side i'm like yeah what does this mean what does it mean creating loads on users you know so definitely she's they're talking about cognitive loads uh, load over here you know or in a way we can say friction that a user faces when they're trying to use an application or any experience be it online or offline so just to elaborate with an example let's say on the left side you see a screenshot okay it's it, it's a, a screenshot of my paypal app okay so there's a here is an a uh, scenario let's say you go out with your friends or buddies over a weekend and you know somebody you, you are doing pints or food and one of your friends is taking care of the tab and later you have to pay them you know uh, whatever it cost it so let's say in this case uh, he spent 4 dollars 17 cents on my behalf so i come back home i open my paypal app and i'm trying to make a payment now let's see what happens when i try to make the payment i i get this error state uh, we are sorry system error please try again later so i'm like yeah okay it happens sometimes right technology i log back after 5 minutes and again there's a failure message you can't go through this transaction for so and so reason i'm like yeah that that doesn't happens too often but it's okay maybe i'll try give it two hours their their problems might have been sorted by then now imagine i try to make this transaction for next uh, over next two three days opening the app for five ten times and i still fail every time in trying to do the action i'm trying to do which is trying to you know transfer this amount to my friend what would happen right chances are you will get frustrated you will quit the app and you will say yeah just delete it i'll use revolut or you know <laughs> my bank account or pay him by a cryptocurrency you know whatever you use um uh, yeah because because you are failing right now let's take the exact same scenario in games it is very common for you to fail <laughs> in games right you can fail five times 10 times even 15 times depending on the difficulty of the level so here what happens is in games if if you are failing to you know achieve the objective of your game uh it's not that we see players quit very few percentage of players will quit we see uh, players keep trying keep trying because a lot of times in games failure equals friction failure equals challenge now if you reverse it for example if you if you're playing a game and every time you play that game you win every single time what will happen you will quit right because you're feeling bored by now you're like yeah is, it's not challenging me enough so that's why when i say ux in games is mostly about managing friction not removing it because friction many times equals challenge challenge which the player has to you know overcome by developing their skills they have to master it and that's the rush they get after when you try to accomplish something very hard you know and um you're trying to get through it and you do that perform that action again and again till you get better at it you use your wits combination of your skills and you you know master it the kind of um, dopamine rush that you get in your head that comes through that challenge and mastery so that's why ux in games mostly is about managing friction not removing it we can't make things too easy because we'll see the opposite effect to mainstream software in paypal if i fail because it's a utility app even on social media you know most of them are utility apps when i'm when i have a intention to do an action i want to be able to do it i want you know that it should be seamless it shouldn't uh, challenge me much but in games yeah that that is turned upside down <laughs> so that's why ux in games is mostly about managing friction and not removing it 
I'll give you, I'll show you a case study example of there are many other differences, but just for the sake of this presentation, because I want to answer more questions rather than just walking you guys through theory. I'll show you a case study. And this is just a vertical slice of how um, UX designers, games UX designers work on a day to day basis. And I'm sure you'd see a lot of parallel with uh, what happens in mainstream UX. So this is one of the early days. Uh, and I was working in an educational gaming company. One of the things from my experience I do want to bring up is um, no process is ever one size fit all approach. The size of the company budget and stakeholder education matters a lot. So no matter where you go in your life, or if you're already working in the industry, you would know every company is different. You know, the UX maturity is different. Uh, the budget, the scale, the size, the product. So what happens is every company will follow a slightly different process. Okay. So before any company that I go to, I've been fortunate to ha have a number of manager and director positions. So every company I went to, I was fortunately or unfortunately, I had to start from scratch. I had to build up a department. So one of the things which I identified having gone through this process of building UX teams and pipelines over and over is even before you think about process, you have to create a culture because there'll be very few things in your favor. If the UX maturity of the company is low, the stakeholders won't know what UX is. You have to educate them. You will have a hard time finding proponent. Why? Because everybody detests change. You are trying to come in and say, hey, you are building, you are used to building products this way, but now, you know, we must integrate UX. Why? What we have works, you know, the kind of, the kind of um, arguments I see are these based on the company size. So in my experience, I've worked with startups. I've also worked with MNCs, multinationals. So while I, it's not true of all the companies, but in my experience, at least a startup is like move fast and break things. The ha hackers with, they are moving very fast, you know, and they don't like being slowed down. And then you have MNCs, you know, multinationals. They, I, I worked in fortune 500 companies. So they are like, we are already established. We have good revenue streams. Hey, haste may lead to waste. Don't fix it if it ain't broken. They are more worried about changing anything because they're like, yeah, our product is already successful. It's used by you know millions of users. Why should we change it? They're, they're very careful about making even the slightest change. So these are two polar opposites I have come across. And the reason I'm sharing with you guys is I'm sure as you go through different companies in your career, you will see these kind of you know attributes or characteristics. Okay, so here I'm going to share a case study about my experience working in a startup. And it was actually in the early game, early days of um, App Store and mobile devices. I joined this company in 2011. And <clears throat> this company was a startup, it was bootstrapped. And later, you know, we were trying to create uh, educational games. So teach children who are K K7 to K12, that is seven to 12 years of age or six to 12 years of age, teach them um, um, subjects like math, English, grammar, through games, gamification in a way. So the company was about educational games. Um, we had to build a product. We raised funding in San Francisco. And as you can see, this was a very, this was a startup. So very small number of people, five people initially. I was the fifth employee. And I was the only employee in the design side of it. So. And they were like, I had to hire people. We had some more people, but literally I was a creative director doing everything from um, UI, UX, art, animation, music, VFX to marketing. <laughs> okay. Of course, we, as we scaled up, we got more specialized. Uh, but yeah, you, you can now see like, like we had to apply lean UX. There wasn't much time to, you know, go for a full stack process. So this is just one of the kind of challenges I had, like, we had to work within constraints and timelines. First thing we wanted to do was, you know, identify again. So what you see here, as you know, a lot of work we do is under NDA. This is just a reconstruction of a, you know, a case study. So some of the data points might not be accurate, but it, it is just built up on the case study we had, you know, just for NDA reasons, uh, like there won't be actual data points here. So first thing was you wanted to understand, okay, you're building games for kids. What do you want to do? You want to understand the psychology of kids, right? And it's very different from adults. So you, you're trying to understand our market was primarily uh, US because, you know, that's where the penetration of mobile devices was the most. So we thought if we could, if we could kind of uh, prove our model there, we can then, you know, expand. So there were a couple of reasons kids wanted to play games. They found them addictive. They loved hanging out with their friends uh, when they were playing games, you know, they could play with them. Um, they were also kids who were like, yeah, being outside is more awesome than being inside. So why should we spend so much time playing video games? And as we dug deeper, we realized, yeah, we, so we built some prototype and we gave it to kids and 
then we realized a lot of feedback came back not from uh, the kids themselves but the parents <laughs> you know they, because these were educational games so we were like yeah it's not just about the kids because we have to understand parents as well you know uh, as well as the kids because what we found was and then we started building what we called a, a parent child persona you know because we realized it's about co play okay when most of the times in this age group when kids are actually trying to learn stuff even doing this school assignments you have parents assisting them so we built some we did some research around that and we found parents were like yeah making kids do school assignment is a nightmare you are competing with so many more fun and engaging distraction cartoons netflix games toys friends you know how do you get kids to you know spend time playing like doing their homework actually or learning so while we did that we also wanted to go a step further we realized you know we also need to understand the psychology of kids now if if you're talking about adults there's lot of studies out there already heuristics which tell us how adults behave but we were in uncharted territory so we were like no that's not enough so one other thing you know we thought could be useful is getting a child psychologist in and they kind of shared with us hey kids explore by touch if they even if they don't understand context of the task Play, uh, young players feel the need to make tactile input so they were like they would tap on everything like for example for an adult if something is flat for example at the top you know uh, they can easily distinguish for an adult it's very easy to distinguish between what is an icon in a ui what is a button compared what is flat text but kids don't do that they would just tap on anything and <laughs> everything so one of the learnings was okay try to make uh, your interface as tactile as possible that is it should give some kind of feedback even if the kid is you know interacting with part of the screen which 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 we won't conventionally expect to be um uh, tactile short attention span and visual learners so yeah they have very short attention span you know and they like to learn visually so no no big text descriptions for them you know try to minimize that use as much of so even if you have tutorial onboarding use visuals and then aid it with uh, sound so we made sure that when we had onboarding we had sound narration as well as more of visual minimizing text as much as we could and compulsive repetitive behavior so this was a third thing which all which also surprised us so one of the things kids do is when they really like an action um they keep on repeatedly doing it there's no logic behind it for example if there's a annoying sound that kids like to hear um by pressing a button they would keep doing it repeatedly okay so this gave us an idea of okay build your animations or reward reward feedbacks in a way which are very rewarding so just to get back to hear that sound or that um a visual sequence the kid would want to perform the action okay so that was also very powerful so combined with the personas uh player persona sorry uh, kid based personas parent personas and this kind of psychology insights uh it was next time to you know do a standard user research we talked spoke to parents and they were like hey um it was very clear that whatever game we design it won't be played just by kids there would be element of parents involved in it so i was like what what the people were telling us based on the personas we built okay i want both offline and online options one of the parents said because we are driving a lot of time wifi might not be available my kids like to play multiplayer so ui option should be super easy my three young kids are playing together so you know yeah a lot of lot of things response time needs to be quick and fast and we did all that we uh, took that feedback so here's an example of you know wire framing <clears throat> and then some kind of you know prototyping one tip i can give you guys is and this is my experience over time i realized doing a lot of user testing in games i try to keep my low fidelity wireframes for me these are low fidelity because they're black and white but i try to keep them illustrative because when i when i often take it to user test if i just show them a box it's very hard for players to you know uh, engage with the prototype because they they're used to seeing a lot of visuals and graphics so what i try to do is i developed my own pipeline of these fast illustrations which kind of mimic the rich experience of a game even in black and white so that worked to my my advantage and that's how i trained my team as well uh now yeah so output we built a lot of games for teaching english geography math you know uh, they were all launched in us and uh one thing which came out is user research in when, when the so what happened was we pushed out these products but we also signed uh, contracts with schools through apple's education program you know because they were very interested in what we were doing and uh, we realized this classrooms were actually we thought they would be used by parents at home but now here's a teacher in their classroom uh, with a class size of 10 20 people you know walking them through this uh, app giving them assignments through it so a whole new 
uh, kind of market opened up for us. Now, again, we didn't necessarily build all these things, but it was just the feedback that we were getting. So we found, you know, a, a, a teacher who's in who's a second grade math teacher, they might want to give assignments. We thought, why can't we build a platform where if a usual worksheet, here are addition sums, looks like this, which might be in the school book, the teacher can simply take their phone, scan the page where the problems are. We have an online platform through which, you know, they can send it to the game. This game is what we call math versus zombies. So it's very simple. You can see that, you know, there are math equations appearing on top of zombies and the kids have to actually punch in the answer. Every time they punch in the answer correctly, they are able to, you know, zap or transform that zombie into a human. And then the second part we added to it was, hey, we are already tracking how the kids are doing. So we create those reports. We send it back to parents, uh, to teachers who can then say, yeah, this is how you did in this assignment. So, I mean, this is the kind of feedback which came, you know, a lot of satisfied kids, a lot of satisfied schools, 6,000 US schools adopted our uh, classroom material. It was actually endorsed by Laureen Powell Jobs, Steve Jobs' wife. She was one of our, the ambassadors for our apps. Uh, we were NASCOM's 50 most innovative edtech startup. Um, yeah, so basically an entire product line can change based on user research and testing. And yeah, that, that was the case today I wanted to share. So yeah, happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. We seem to have a lot of questions about um, making UX an important feature in a design uh, for a design element. So we've one question here that is about how do you convince managers or seniors that the time spent researching, doing usability tests, mm -hmm. redesigning is actually worth the effort? So like, how would you convince them that a lot of work spent on the front saves them time in the long run? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's a very common one. And I'll be honest with you, this is one of the hardest tasks, especially if you end up in a company which has what I call low UX maturity. So guys, there are a couple of tactical and strategic things you have to do. You know, first thing is it starts with interview. Okay. Make sure when you are interviewing for a company, it's okay if they don't know anything about UX, but you need to gauge, hey, is there an appetite for UX? They might say, we don't know much about UX. We need this goal. And you need to be very upfront. Yeah. I would want to join a company where, you know, people have an open mind, even if they don't know anything about UX and always check what is the affinity with high level stakeholders with high level. I mean, your PMs, maybe even uh, VPs, executives, because it is possible your manager who's hiring you might say, yeah, we are going to make a difference. But if people at top level do not believe in it, then, you know, it's not going to happen. And I'll be, why I'm saying that is, you know, it might sound a bit negative, because I have had UX designers who for years have been telling me, oh, my man, this company, they just don't hear me. By, by the, when was, I was hired, I was so excited, but now nobody is giving me a ear. So I, when I give my interviews, I say, hey, it's fine. You don't know about UX, but uh, who is a proponent? What is, what is your opinion? Why, why do you think you need UX? So I need to learn why they want me. And if it's like, yeah, because we want to boost revenue, <laughs> that's never a, never a good answer. Now, once you are inside, that's why I say always gauge the culture. What is the culture? That's why I said, forget about process and pipeline. Think about culture. So what is culture? Culture is simply how they're operating right now. Uh, what are the KPIs they think about? See, with UX, if you always, now many companies have different KPIs, like they are tracking engagement, they're tracking, most of the time product will talk about LTV, you know, lifetime value or, uh, you know, uh, average revenue per day or those kind of things. You have to, you have to make a strong case of usability because the way I sell my argument is, Hey, we always have to think of re retention, engagement, monetization. If we can retain our players by giving them, giving them a good experience and give them an engaging, meaningful experience, then they would want to spend for your premium service, right? Because you, you, you should always, if you're giving them value for their time, they would be willing to, you know, spend money into it. So monetization will come. But don't focus on that as your primary metrics. And it's fine if people never pay for it. They're still, you know, going to bring in a lot more traffic if they feel good about your, you know, app. They'll advertise it, you know, organically they'll talk about it. And when you are actually, so what I try to do is I listen. First thing I do is listen to, you know, problems everybody's facing and then propose your pipeline. Always try to first, you know, have your full stack and lean version there. And then to show them value, I always try to find a low stake uh, low stakes project or a feature, because if they have a deadline in two weeks and you say, Hey, you know what? We need to add one week of user research and then three days wireframing. And then, you know, they're like, sorry, oh, this is, this has to go out in two weeks. So I'll ask them, give me a feature. Uh, first, you can always ask about user research. Hey, do you know uh, who your target audience is? Who are your customers? Oh no, we never invested in that. Okay. 
on my own i'll start doing that so kick off that user research okay on the side do you do customer interviews trying to know different parts of the company there'll be customer support do customer interviews do focus groups but then find out which feature is supposed to be like let's say launch hypothetically they'll say yeah this feature is supposed to be launched in quarter 2 or you said quarter or let's say quarter 3 we are in quarter 2 right now right july so i have 3 months okay uh will you be okay if i start showing you uh, how we take this process through ux pipeline will you be uh, invested in the value they're like yeah so the pm will be like i have enough time why not let's give it a go so that that strategy seems to work well for me because we we bring them into interviews and again expose everything bring them into interviews bring them into user testing i know it sounds cliched but once you show them their assumptions are challenged you know they always they, they are willing to buy in more and more and another thing i found very so one is try out a feature with low stakes enough uh, timeline i found insights that you can pull in from customers that they are not aware uh, which they don't know which they have assumed open up their minds but also the power of prototyping so i believe prototyping design prototyping i'm not talking about code if you code that's great but just the ability to build prototypes faster than developers without spending a dime because in every company games or non games development time is the most expensive time so if you are building these high fidelity prototypes which blow them away or even mid fidelity which give them a section of the experience they're like yeah this is cool this is something i can definitely integrate so you know those are some of the ways i think you can find success and start changing what i want uh, you know hearts and minds thank you now we have a we have a question here from okan about just the gaming industry the wider gaming industry mm-hmm. um and they ask It seems like the gaming experience has become more intense since PlayStation 5 released the DualSense controller. So, how do you think UX will contribute to this to this kind of like technology in the near future? Yeah, well, that, that's a great question, and I, I'll 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 be honest with you. So, see, <clears throat> PC consoles they kind of cater more to. So let me let me go back a bit, uh, rephrase this uh, answer. like i said the mobile revolution happened around 2007 you know when smartphones came before that a lot of gaming which happened was console and pc driven i worked on a lot of pc console games and they were for a niche audience so gamer if you define someone as a gamer they were like more supposedly hardcore these are the people that's why these complex controls were designed right we can have the same game on pc but for those gamers who have evolved beyond pc who want more dexterity more complexity more multi touch for them those controllers were required because their reaction time could be faster right especially playing what we call first person shooter games on pc if you're using a regular mouse like this by the time you click <laughs> the other guy has taken you out and then came you know razer which is a very well known uh, sophisticated mouse developing they they have like lightning fast uh, mouse hardware and then the console guy said no we'll develop a controller for you because you are your skill level is so high your dexterity is so high so if you look at consoles they are they are kind of and again i, I cannot generalize it but my assumption is in my personal opinion they are building these games which uh, appeal a lot to hardcore gamers who have already gone beyond you know that casual and mid core phase so we divide gamers into casual mid core hardcore based on their experience and the kind of games they play but on mobile actually the reverse is happening you know right now so many big uh, console developers are creating big hits on mobile which was always considered difficult because of the controls required so uh, um, D- uh, diablo inferno just came out which is a diablo franchise an rpg uh, and they have made it so easy to play cod a lot of you have heard about call of duty right online play call of duty online on pc and play on mobile on mobile it's so easy i i always died a lot when i'm playing online games i'm bad at fps But on mobile, it's so easy. I can tell you, like even your probably, if your grandma or grandpa are into games, even they can play it on mobile. So on on mobile, we are seeing this push towards accessibility, and a lot of this is coming through UX work. A lot of this is coming through user research, and it's big on console and PC too. But it's just about which target audience you are catering to, and I can like assure you. uh that's where gaming is heading in, in terms of ux designer it is on our mind is it for casual audience mid core audience hardcore audience so i think yeah there's a big role ux and ur play there um and we have a question here from abdalla which is has the most upvotes so this is a very important question um and they ask um there is a big confusion in the gaming community about the ui and ux of the yeah. interface and the ux of the game itself and its world so how can you become a game ux designer in terms of the world and the game itself rather than the interface 
Yeah, that, that's a very good good question. You know, you are right. So I I've heard them um, like when I started out, they were they always thought, hey, you are a UI UX designer, and I'm like, yeah, I, I've been doing UI, but you know, I don't want to be a UI UX designer. Initially, I did those kind of roles, and then I realized they thought UX was more UI because visual stuff appealed more. Right? I we also had terms in gaming industry like U UI artist, UX artist. I'm like, what is a UX artist? There's no such thing as a UX artist. So. unfortunately that's true but it's changing okay the there is a trickle down effect ux first found its foothold in enterprise software right like utility app social design you know social mainstream software other than outside games so there's a delay in when it trickles down to games because a lot of talent from enterprise software product practices are coming to games so right now i built specialized team my team has dedicated user researchers dedicated ux designers de- dedicated uh ui designers even ui technical designers who actually take ui and put it inside a game engine which is a completely different skill set so yeah i think it's you you are absolutely right like it's not about hey you are not a wireframe monkey your job is not oh there is a cool feature spec and convert it into you know wireframe no 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 you are talking about player journey you know you are talking about okay you are coming so so the kind of conversation that's why you have to integrate yourself as a core part of product team not you know art team we have a art team where usually ui designers sit so you are working with product game designer ux so you are working at the feature level the spec level you are saying so first question when they say we want to build this feature you know i would ask is why uh oh, and if they say oh yeah because it's very cool or because that game is doing it i'm like no that's not good enough <laughs> i i would say okay is it something our audiences want we should do some user research are in our genre similar games which have this kind of gameplay do do they have we do do we have good examples so we'll benchmark why the, how many of them do it what is good about it what is bad about it? and then we'll ask is this a good practice will it increase uh, will it be easy to you know make player comprehend it will it uh, how will it affect the engagement and uh, you know uh, enjoyment of the game so yeah you are going way beyond it and then the way we do it is a full stack cycle discovery phase then prototyping phase then actual launch and then we also push out servers and say hey how was your so what we are doing is ab testing we don't launch to uh, you know everyone at one time we'll say we'll take a set of uh, 20000 players and we launch this feature and and before that we actually do usability testing you know uh, we we have kind of uh, got rid of the features by talking to players by testing a design prototype that's why i stress a lot on prototype where they said yeah if this feature came in i would laugh at it i mean this is laughable this is not what something you should do they like yeah i don't see myself playing with it and while product manager was very intent on no this is a cool feature because this other game is doing it uh, and we were like no we are not sure about it we want to propose a test so always validate and they can the feature they said yeah we realize it <laughs> it's not not a good bet you know so yeah you you are not just there for somebody handing you over always question that's your job and if you if you have a stand if you have a argument against it validate any time it comes to a deadlock i always tell them we need to validate either through user research or through testing uh, so yeah that's what i was and then when it comes to actually breaking into a career as a as a ux designer for games and um, we have a question here from so hyun lee who asks in your experience as a hiring manager what do you look for in a prospective employee yeah so it depends again on the level for i'm hiring right if i'm hiring a junior i'm i'm looking for like potential i'm looking for the raw talent i i know that whatever they deliver might not be it it's not something i can put it in a product straight away so i'm looking for hey how engaged you are passion is a big thing okay you want to be in games what what are, what are reasons why you want to join gaming industry if it's just to make money no <laughs> there's no easy way to do it so yeah what like bit of bit of the you know ux practices you get into that mode hmm analyze this person what is your motivation where do you see yourself why do you want to join and yeah do you understand games like i said you know it's good if you are a gamer but more than that you need to have a avid interest and i also see for i see a balance of soft skill and hard skill so for a junior also i would see some things i definitely see is like empathy you know you don't want somebody who's very opinionated for example one thing i always give them a test it is you know tweaked to whether it's a junior senior or a principal so when you look at their portfolio portfolio is very important i'll first look at that you know and it's fine if you don't have industry experience just take any game that you like or any cool idea you might have build a case study like a case study i showed you not all parts of that were actually executed but uh, you know i built something on top of you know what what was there because of india reason but you can do the same 
for example you are saying you maybe you are playing uh, fortnite and there is some something which you really don't like you say yeah this this part of the player journey the way you know this cycle works or way i have to uh, gain these weapons or these other things which will of i progress is not good how can we improve it so if you have gone out you have looked at player comments reviews picked up a pain point did your own research maybe even did some interviews and put your case studies there this is a better way to do it i will accept i will like yeah look at this guy they are still showing me the traits of a ux designer they are inquisitive they can identify pain points when they identify pain points they are not just going with the opinion they are trying to validate it with little bit of user research i understand it's limited and then they are showing me these are the potential solutions so that's what i look for and when i give them the test it's not about the final output it's their journey how do you go about it um now if you go for a senior i would look for yeah this guy should have some experience i would normally want them to have game industry experience or you know relevant uh, software industries again case studies i think it's a good idea to have even if you are not from games industry you know you can still build a case study around game let it be hypothetical that will catch my attention because it shows me you have taken the you know time to understand and to look at that from your perspective it might not be perfect but it's good enough it shows me your interest and then when the technical test goes same thing they are grilled on basis of that like uh, hey why did you so we, we i always give a part of research so whatever assignment i give it's a small assignment there's enough time usually i give them a week weekends included and then i ask them okay this is the feature i want you to build from this games do your show us your research and then show us your wireframe and prototype if you have the time you know and then they present it to the entire team and the first question i ask is okay om these are the competitors i looked at i'm like how did you look at those how did you decide that those were main competitors and then say yeah i looked at online reviews i looked at uh, you know If, so you need to see what is what is their thinking process are they thinking like a ux designer and most of the time ux designer is very logical it's almost like writing code you have to be logical your choices have to be are you using a framework for uh, like many times when they criticize the feature that i've given them i'm like okay what heuristic framework you are using you know so somehow you are looking for do they have the education and also do they use it you know it shouldn't be like yeah just because it's cool or it's trending blah blah, blah not like that so it's 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 assessment of both soft skill hard skill and what i would call ux aptitude uh, that i look for great and we have a question here from alice who asks who says it sounds like a lot of your roles have been very intensive could you describe your work life balance as a ux designer yeah brilliant question so i think there are two sides to it louis and alice you know don't get me wrong but you know i think it's as much on a person as it is a, these are the factors you, how you are as a person how you look at your work life balance plus also the company you are in for almost one third of my life and that's me i've been a workaholic so i have worked i have done graveyard shift by choice i would start at 3 pm in my first job and go because that company had two shifts 3 pm it starts 12 pm it ended the early days of gaming my first job i was an intern over time i wanted to learn learn more more hungry and i was a bachelor of course we back then you know just out of college i would work till 6 pm in the morning also because there was air conditioning in the office and snacks <laughs> i would practice watch movies after my work hours come back home i was trying to get better at sketching 6 to 7 pm i would be in front of a computer sketching and then go to sleep at 8 pm do i recommend it no <laughs> don't do that so but later in my life as i grow got older i realized no you don't need it you know you should have a work life balance so software industry not just gaming is known for crunching long hours so that's something you should check for interviews read glassdoor reviews okay uh, talk to some people on linkedin hey how's the work life for me it's very important right now right now uh, even in my team in my one to ones we that's the first thing i check how is your work life balance you should always there will be times undoubtedly being in software or any other industry you will have to you know go the extra mile but having said that in my experience i've team teams burnt out i have burnt out myself i had to take a sabbatical so what i'm saying is if you're joining a good company startups usually have more intense work life balance compared to uh, you know established companies or mncs but uh, rated very high because you know it it, ha- it can burn you out and it's getting better it's getting better across the industry because we we talk about it a lot software community talks about it a lot but you have to do your due diligence 
Brilliant. I think that's a, an excellent question to, to finish with today because we're, we're at the very end of our hour. Um, Om, thank you so much for just being so illuminating and so open and honest with all of your, your questions and the answers that you've given us. And I think um, you started well talking about how you, you got into gaming because you wanted to make and then break. And then you ended with a note saying, "Get into if you get into the gaming industry, don't break yourself. So I think that, that wraps, <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to sum it. That wraps up very nicely. Um, thank you so much for taking part. And thank you, everybody, for giving such brilliant questions. I barely had to check my question sheet, sheet, uh, question sheet at all. Um, stay tuned for more um, live events that will be coming up from the UX Design Institute. And um, there will be a live recording sent out to everybody who registered for this event. So you'll be able to actually go back, rewatch and pause um, and look at all um, slides to see if there's anything that you missed the first time around. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, all. Guys, thanks for the brilliant session.